Hello everybody. As you all probably know by now, I am a fan of an unusual car. And it must be said, I actually don't mind a Peugeot either. I've owned a couple of them and they were largely pretty good to me, so I don't have anything really against the brand. And today I've been brought this, an RCZ. They actually went out of production about four years ago after a run of a, about five years from 2010 to 2015. They are, as Peugeots go, a pretty weird and oddball car. But until today, I never really even sat in one. So when its friendly owner Carl got in touch and offered me the chance to drive his, well, I couldn't say no. That is a common theme you'll probably appreciate on many videos that I do, but I think that's just part and parcel of being a petrol head that's interested in well, a lot of things. The most obvious rival for the RCZ would be the Audi TT. The key difference being that the TT was available in both coupe and convertible form. The RCZ is a strict coupe in two plus two guys. There is, there is a little bit of room in the back for kids, but really it's a bit of extra storage space. And indeed this car does have a lot of that. The boot on this thing is utterly huge. So I can't help but think that maybe they did plan on making a convertible version and then realized they already have at least two convertibles in the range. So it probably would have been overkill. Despite the fact that I've been looking at RCZs on occasion for the last nine years, I still cannot make my mind up as to whether I like the looks of them or not. They're very shapely and indeed that double bubble roof is absolutely gorgeous, but it's a very, very cab forward design that gives away its sort of front wheel drive hatchback origins. Indeed, dive under the skin of this and you'll find an awful lot in common with a Peugeot 308. The choice of engines available to RCZ customers was three versions of 1.6 litre turbo petrol, here in 156 horsepower guys, then a 200 horsepower version and a mighty 270 horsepower engine in the RCZ-R. There was also the choice of a two litre diesel for those who wanted their sporty looking car to be a little bit more economical. This car has a six speed manual. An auto box did exist, but in the UK it was a very rare option indeed. The biting point of the clutch is ridiculously high, but that's not the main thing that I'm thinking about right now. What I'm thinking about is how ridiculously nice this car is in here. I've seen many RCZs from the outside, but never from the inside. And I honestly expected when I opened the door of this car today to go, oh, look, it's my old 207 van inside. How rubbish. I could not have been more wrong. Now, this one is a magnetic version, which features a few upgrades, but I'm not particularly expert in the model, so I'm not going to try and claim what they are. However, this thing is a real proper nice place to be. You've got gorgeous leather seat. You've got a really nicely sized leather steering wheel. Even the dials are quite a bit nicer than the regular Peugeot items, although you can see they are, of course, derived from regular Peugeot items. Even the dash and the doors have got loads of leather and nice stitching on them. Well, this I don't think is actually leather, but, but the dash definitely is amazing absolutely amazing this genuinely feels like a premium place to be and you have to remember my current daily driver is a bmw 760 li so i spend a lot of time in a nice cabin and this is genuinely wonderful visibility out is very good indeed you've got a nice view out the back great side visibility it's only this sort of thick and steeply raked a pillar that kind of interferes but you're positioned far enough ahead that it doesn't really get in the way. Even the clock in the center of the dash is quite nice. It's got sat nav, it's got Bluetooth, it's got dual zone climate control, all sorts of things that I didn't really think you would find in a 2013 Peugeot. Now the gear shift is, it's all right. 3.6 Ronchon, not great, not terrible. Probably much better in reality than the one that I had in my old 407 and indeed my 207, but it's certainly not a gearbox that I'm going to remember. The car is reasonably economical at a sort of steady 30 odd mile an hour. It's claiming some sort of 60 something miles to the gallon. 
that's perhaps a touch optimistic, but I do know these engines in other applications and they are generally pretty good. They aren't the most robust, and that's one reason that this car's owner has decided to buy this car with extremely low miles and with a proper Peugeot warranty on it. Now, I apologize for the fact that the car is a little bit filthy for the exterior shots, but you're just going to have to deal with it because, well, it's horrible out there today. It's, it's a nasty, nasty old day, and that's just, that's just the curse of trying to film a video on YouTube in Britain in the winter. One interesting fact about this car is that it wasn't built by Peugeot. It was actually built by Magna Steyr in Graz in Austria. And if you think that's a familiar name, well, it probably is, because they are the very same people currently building the Toyota Supra and BMW Z4. Indeed, this feels like a very well put together car. The steering is the traditional Peugeot, totally devoid of feel, but it's got a, a little bit of weight to it. The engine doesn't have the most pull, but again, I am spending my days in a 440 horsepower V12, which I think does skew my perspective somewhat. If I'd spent the last week in the S2000, I might have a sort of different opinion about it. But of course, better engines, or certainly more powerful ones, are available should you choose. It corners nicely. It's fairly well planted despite the fact that it's incredibly greasy out there today. The brakes work fairly well there, reasonably grabby, but not impossible to modulate. And honestly, I wouldn't expect anything different. And it makes an all right noise. It's not the lightest car on earth, thanks to the fact that it's not a bespoke sports car chassis, but it sort of does the job. Really, for a lot of people, it would be an appealing car because it looks nice and outlandish and, and crazy, but has very sensible underpinnings, which means that maintenance is going to be, in theory, no worse than on really any other equivalent Peugeot product. It being a Peugeot, I suspect that means things probably will eventually break, but it does feel rather better put together than any other Peugeot I've driven. You can heel and toe in it surprisingly easily, actually, and that really is a bit of a bonus. Windscreen wipers don't really seem to be doing their job very well. That is standard French car. When you're not pressing on, it's a nice, quiet place to be. And you got a lovely view out the side. Well, it's really quite special. You can see that sort of funky rear arch. It's all very nice indeed. Really, for me, the RCZ never appealed for a couple of simple reasons. Number one, it's front-wheel drive. And number two, it does look like it should be a target dog. I mean, if you think about it, obviously this couldn't possibly be a target dog. Look at the way it's shaped, it's, it's crazy, it's nuts. But there's a, a nice big seam at the front and the back of this double bubble roof, which makes it look like it is a target panel. And I think that's why most people, when they look at RCZs, go, oh, is it a convertible? No, it, it, it's, it's, it's not. I thought this was going to be one of those cars where, yeah, it looks funky and different and, and a bit interesting, but when you actually get down to it, it's just a 308 and a dress, which I suppose in some ways it is, but you know, you look at it, something like that came we've just gone past and it looks quite special, looks quite different. They are a, a reasonably rare car, but not massively uncommon, but I don't see them on a regular basis. Prices on these start from about four or five grand, although I'd probably advise to try and spend a little bit more on one, which means that they are, I guess, a little bit cheaper than an equivalent TT, because four or five grand on an Audi TT is going to get you something that's quite a bit older than one of these, possibly a, a late Mark I, something like that. The engine responds fairly well. The pedals are nice enough to use, other than that, that clutch, which is just a very typical French car. I actually really enjoy it. I love this steering wheel. I mean, that really is just enhancing the entire car. I mean, it's just not quite as bonkers as in the 208 GT by Peugeot Sport, which has something that seems to be stolen out of a Caterham, but still very nice in here. The seats are actually pretty comfy, and indeed, they, they look really special. 
they look like something out of a, a high-end BMW. They look, they remind me of the ones that I found in the E39 M5, which had the heritage leather option in it. They are genuinely lovely things. They're electric memory seats as well with heating. If a performance car is what you're after, I would suggest seeking out the 200 horsepower version as a sort of minimum and maybe the RCZ-R if you can find one of those. I don't know how many they made, but I expect they were probably a relatively hard sell when they came out. And not only do they have a 270 horsepower version of this engine, but they do have some extras to help them cope, a trick limited sort of diff and stuff like that. So I think those probably are quite a bit of fun. So the sort of medium speeds like I'm doing now, 40 mile an hour on a sort of broken road where the car's weakness shows through, the suspension is still stiff enough to kind of get all of those road imperfections through to you, but it can't really smooth them out in the way that a truly great suspension would. But honestly, I feel like I'm being a fairly harsh critic of the car. I don't think my S2000 would really ride those bumps any better. Not creaking or rattling at all, and that is indeed very impressive. In fact, even the sort of switch gear that they've sourced from cheaper models, like the, the window switches down here, don't really bring the place down and actually feels pretty cohesive in here. If you're expecting it to be a sort of rival for something like the new Renault Alpine, uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it is still, as mentioned, that regular chassis underneath. So while it delivers the driving experience better than you think, it, it's not a dedicated sports car platform. Just isn't. But the price reflects that. There we go everyone, a very brief look at the Peugeot RCZ in a rather sodden British countryside. Hope you've enjoyed it. This has actually been a genuine surprise to me and it's a car that I actually like a lot more than I thought I would. So thank you for watching, thanks to the owner for bringing it down. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already and we'll see you for the next one, which is gonna be rather good. Bye bye.